joining us this evening for our Equality and Diversity BAME at the Bar um, evening. My name is Clara Jennings and I am a third year law student at Arden University. I'm also an ambassador for aspiring barristers with whom I'm working in conjunction with this evening. And I'd just like to pass over to Harriet Jones to just say a quick few words um, about Arden. Um, not really too much to say, I promise. I won't detract from your event too much. Um, for those of you who have not yet had the misfortune of meeting me, my name's Harriet Jones. I'm the deputy head of the law school. Um, I also had the misfortune of being a barrister for a very short period of time. Non-practicing, thank goodness. I found teaching and I fell in love with it. But this is a wonderful profession to be a part of. Um, and whatever we can do to increase access and to make it um, an even better place to work, the better. So I strongly support this event and hope you enjoy this evening. I'll be monitoring the chat box for Clara, so I'll be able to push any of your questions forward to her later on. So enjoy yourselves and uh, yes, have a good evening. Thank you. So um, Aspiring Barristers is an organisation centred around supporting um, aspiring barristers with their journey towards the bar. And um, the primary aim of aspiring aspiring barristers is to firstly introduce and increase diversity and to promote um, a further ethos of increased accessibility to the bar. So yeah, special thank you to Arden University for allowing us to use the university's platform this evening and thanks to Harriet Jones. So I'll remind you again just to keep those um, sorry, your, your microphones muted and keep your cameras off. So I'm delighted to introduce Silesh Mehta. Um, he is from Red Lion Chambers. And if we could just uh, get an overview of how you came to the bar and your journey to kick I'll the I'll try to do it as quickly as possible. I, I'm a sort of a lesson, an exercise on how not to do it. Uh, so I, I uh, did a law degree against all the advice of my teachers at school. I was the wrong colour, the wrong uh, uh, sort to, to do a law degree. Uh, and then I went into accountancy and within a day discovered that it was the, uh, a job that I didn't want to do for the rest of my life. So I am a runaway from accountancy, came to the bar fully expecting that I'd fail and end up back in accountancy, but at least I'll have tried and failed. Um, and so every year that I'm still at the bar is a year away from accountancy. And that's helped me in my choices that I've always had to make. Whenever I've been at a crossroads in my career, whether at pupillage or tenancy or, or in choosing what path to take in the future, I've always opted for the fun path because I know that I may end up as a chartered accountant uh, the next year. Uh, and the advantage of that is it's a, a, a more fun path, but also it means that as long as I wasn't chasing money, was only chasing what I enjoyed, eventually uh, the money does come in, I think, anything that you do, uh, because you will bring passion to it and you'll work hard at it. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, you, you, there will be rewards at the end of it. So that's my uh, Potter journey to now. Fantastic. Thank you. So the attendees have all put together some questions this evening as well. And um, so we will be bringing those to you. Um, so let's just have a look here. So did you face any specific problems when securing a pupillage that you felt your non-BAME counterparts didn't face? Uh, I, 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 certainly the pupillage that I did, uh, I was at a, uh, what was then a, uh, and still is a well-known set of chambers. In fact, the one that Brad uh, is at, uh, at the Hollis Whiteman Chambers. Um, the, the profession, I should say, was extremely conservative in those days. And so when I uh, started, when I was at bar school, there was something known as ghetto chambers. Uh, and uh, to my shock, when I attended one of these, uh, as I was walking around the inns of court, I discovered uh, that, uh, that, that the traditional bar, which was mainly white male Anglo-Saxon, uh, by and large, uh, did not allow members of, from BAME uh, communities to, to join them. And so there were what were known as, uh, horrifically, as ghetto sets, where you'd get a whole set that was made up of uh, BAME uh, people. 
and we, we've moved a long way since then. Uh, even those from Jewish communities were uh, were prejudiced against, and and so you sometimes had sets of chambers that were mainly made from the Jewish community. So that was in the, the mid 80s. I'm sure it was worse for the generation before me. Uh, but uh, luckily, I think Brad's generation has it much, much better uh, in that there is much more diversity, much more equality. Uh, the interviews are now better done. You don't need photographs as we did in, in my day. You know, the interviews are more structured and usually the people who carry out the interviews, uh, certainly in my chambers and most uh, major chambers, have training in diversity and equality to make sure that they don't carry on making the mistakes that the bar was making. Thank you for that. And question two for you, how do chambers actively promote equality and diversity within their sets? Okay, can I give some specific examples and then uh, one can broaden it out. Uh, mm -hmm. So one specific example is uh, that we made sure that we have an equality and diversity committee. Uh, and we put someone very senior in chambers in charge of that. Uh, and that committee makes sure that, uh, that the initial resistance you get in every chambers, whatever uh, the makeup of your chambers, to, to a committee of that sort that was set up many years ago, is what on earth do we need this for? Because, of course, none of us are racist, none of us are prejudiced. Uh, but the trick is to keep at it. And so the committee constantly involved members of chambers. There was a newsletter that we had uh, almost every two weeks to say what we were doing. We then try to reach out to uh, areas that ordinarily chambers like ours uh, would not reach out to. So we reached out to schools, uh, to inner city schools, and see if we can involve children there. Uh, we try to reach out to universities that otherwise would not necessarily have graduates that would apply to chambers like ours. Um, uh, we're part of a scheme, the, the, the East London uh, Business Association scheme, ELBA, um, which actively promotes uh, access to uh, not just the law but all other professions amongst specific universities. And so there are particular projects that not just us, but every other chambers can do. And I think uh, the, the vast majority of chambers are slowly getting there. And so you can not only uh, promote uh, the, the range of people that apply to your chambers, uh, so you can then start selecting the best across the field. You can let the outside world know that this is what you want to do. Uh, and therefore, there's that positive feedback loop that you will generate as soon as you start doing something, even if it's small baby steps that will then grow into something much bigger. Thank you for that. Thanks, Eilish. Thank you so much for joining us this evening as well and answering those questions. And I hope that um, those uh, people that have asked that question are uh, happy with that response. I think it was fantastic. Thank you. So our next speaker this evening will be Brad Lewis. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you to tell us a little bit more about yourself and your journey to the bar as well. Yeah, uh, thing. So my name's Brad. Uh, I'm a current pupil coming to the end of my first six. So the non-practicing section of uh, pupillage at QEB Hollis Whiteman, uh, which is a crime chambers in London. And I'm due to start on my feet, as they call it. So doing my own advocacy uh, at the beginning of April. I came to the bar from, I think, having quite a clear idea in my head when I was 16 that I wanted to be a barrister. I took A-levels that were essay based to, to try and sort of get me into university. I grew up in, in Nottingham, um, but went to Liverpool, um, Liverpool University for my undergrad and then on and went on and did a master's elsewhere uh, and did the bar course straight after that. Um, I got pupillage whilst I was doing the bar course, but I still paralegaled for a year and worked as a police station representative at back home in Nottingham for a criminal defence firm uh, and then started pupillage. Um, and that was my, so it was quite a, quite a linear um, way to the bar. Uh, I did get distracted for a while in my undergrad thinking I was going to do various different things never accountancy that sort of never tickled my fancy but other things um and, and yeah and here i am that's great so a few questions for you as well in your opinion what can be implemented to ensure students from bame are not disadvantaged because where they are from or the color of their skin 
sorry could you just uh you i lost signal for a brief second it's all right just re- <laughs> yeah so in your opinion what can be implemented yeah. to ensure that students from a vain background are not disadvantaged because where they are from or because of the color of their skin um i think that the answer obviously will necessarily vary from chambers to chambers um, and you know from course providers course provider etc but there are certain general things that can be thought about more or implemented better for example um, uh, when I saw this question I think about this and I thought well one thing that's quite key is um, having specific pre-interview pre and even pre-application discussions in chambers uh, about selection criteria and about the application structure and process and in that discussion having a very sort of honest and frank look at at every factor and speaking amongst each other as to you know do these things create a risk of um, bias based on appearance based on race based on sex Um, there are certain things that you will see featured in various chambers selection criteria that I saw along the way that made me incredibly anxious like manner, presentation, temperament, for example. Um, Theoretically, these are all justifiable criteria that you would want to look for um, in in a barrister, potentially, and I can see why people would say that, you know, these are things that we want to be looking for. But yeah, the chambers have to have an honest conversation with themselves about what do these mean? And are we applying them in such a way that it introduces the risk of bias, the risk of prejudice, asking oneself, well, what is a 10 out of 10 Um, in terms of manner? What what is a 10 out of 10? And are there certain racial groups or groups within society that tend to never therefore score well in what you hold up to be a 10 out of 10 in manner? So that's one thing, a frank conversation. to compulsory bias awareness training, I think someone someone might have mentioned it a moment ago, but it's obviously um, a, a lot of chambers do it now. My chambers do it. Um, it is key not just for people that are going on to interview panels, but for those uh, for for everybody in chambers. I think, um, and, and also a kind of a more intentional selection of panels, it, even in today's day and age, despite the fact that diversity within the bar is growing. It's not uncommon to find yourself in front of a panel that is quite homogenous in terms of sex or, or race. Um, and that can, that's, that's a difficulty, I think, for chambers. Um, one, because if you, if you don't have such diversity within your set that you can put these people forward, then that's obviously something that you want to be looking at yourself. But two, it creates, that, that's a lot of people's first impression of those chambers a lot of applicants don't have the opportunity to do mini pupillages or, or what have you um, with sets. So that, that's their first influence, their, their, first, um, their first look at a chamber, their first impression. Um, so I think that's important. Thank you, Brad. And another question that came in as well for you, um, being a BAME barrister, were you influenced towards a certain inner core or did you choose on merit of career aspirations? And just, just before you answer that, there's, there's four members of Lincoln's in here, <laughs> I think this evening. Um, so yeah. yeah, did it, yeah. was there a particular reason that you chose yeah. your in? Yeah, uh, so I'm not with Lincoln's, I'm at Gray's in, which is the best in. Um, I, picked grades. <laughs> I, I picked grades for a variety of reasons. Um, the first, I've got to be honest, first and foremost, it was funding. I'm not from a privileged background. I grew up in a, um, a sort of a very working class, single parented family. I was, my brother, my brother and I were the first people in our family to finish school, let alone go to university. Um, and so funding was a real key consideration. And there are, uh, can you still hear me? It's saying my internet connection's unstable. Oh. Yeah, it's all fine. Yeah. So can you hear me? 
Okay. Um, there are a variety of different sort of funding approaches by the different inns in terms of bar scholarships uh, and then scholarships thereon, pupillage scholarships, for example. Um, and that's something that you need to have an honest sort of look at. Uh, and, and that's something that influenced me. Greys at the time when I applied offered bigger scholarships to fewer people, whereas Middle offered uh, more scholarships, for example, to, to of smaller amounts. Um, each inn has its own approach and there, and there will be an approach that suits you. For me, it was Greys because I knew that it was make or break for me. I, uh, uh, I wanted a bigger scholarship. I needed a bigger scholarship. I wasn't going to be able to do the bar course and I know that Lincoln's are that Lincoln's are kind of of that way of thinking as well in that they have bigger scholarships and fewer of them whereas middle and, and inner when I was applying at least were more scholarships few um with smaller amounts so funding was sort of first and foremost and two who I knew in the end it just so happened that um almost every single barrister and judge that I knew was at Gray's Inn and they were all lovely people. They'd all offered to be mentors for me. And it was everyone from my good friend who was a, sort of a future pupil at now. He's just been taken on as a tenant at Landmark. Um, and he was a, he's, he's a black barrister. Um, and he said Gray's was fantastic and welcoming. Uh, and I remember sitting down and having a drink with uh, Dame Justice, uh, as it was at the time, I mean, Lady Justice Dobbs. Uh, and she was at Gray's as well. And she was, you know, singing its praises. So it was a kind of like family type of very welcoming vibe that I got from the people that I met from Gray's um, and the, the kind of the obvious diversity that I saw myself within Gray's, but first and foremost funding and that honest conversation with myself. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Thank you. And um, so up next, we have Mark Robinson. Um, so, Mark, can you share with us your own journey to the bar and let us know a little bit more about yourself? Right. So my journey is a lot different, extremely different to um, a lot of you guys. So I was brought up in foster care, um, had a difficult childhood. I left school with no GCSEs and absolutely no A-levels. I was in gangs when I was younger, got in an awful lot of trouble. Um, then I fortunately I got into the music industry, but became a DJ for many years. And I was on BBC Radio on Extra as a presenter for three years doing the house mix show. I played all over the world. I produced, for, um, I had an album out with Ministry of Sound. I produced for David Guetta and Pitbull um, and Akon. Um, and then I finished DJing in 2012, met my wife around that time. Now my wife's ex-partner was violent towards her. Um, I stepped in one day and we had an altercation. Um, I ended up getting charged with um, ABH, assault occasion in the actual bodily harm. It went all the way to Woolwich Crown Court in 2014, May. And the barrister that was meant to do my case, um, his case overran. So I ended up representing myself in Woodish Crown Court. Um, I got hung jury on the first time, but I met a prosecutor by the name of David Jenkins, God rest his soul. I think he was at 10KBW. He's no longer with us now. He passed a couple of years ago. Um, he took off his wig. I, 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 this is after I cross-examined the complainant and said, you need to do this as a living, you're that good. And so I got hung jury the first time. I had to dust myself off and, and go again. I had a, nearly a mental breakdown in between because of the stress of it all. Um, 2014, November, I went back to Woodish Crown Court, representing myself yet again against advice from everyone because I had to do my own case prep. I did have a solicitor's firm behind me at that time, but um, I did really well. Um, and one particular barrister who's now at my chambers, Anteo, watched me do the whole thing on the second trial. Um, and then I'm obviously I'm here now, so I got acquitted. <laughs> um, uh, unanimously acquitted after an hour and a half. The, the officer that arrested me told me to become an accredited police rep. And then um, I went, I approached a firm who was representing me and they took me on as a probationary accredited police rep. Um, bearing in mind that I had no um, education at all, they told me to do a Silex level three in criminal litigation. Um, I couldn't do that because it transpired that I had dyspraxia. So someone else told me to try Birkbeck and do a degree. Now I didn't even want to be a lawyer, let alone um, do a degree but I ended up doing the degree started passing all the exams god knows how 
got really high grades and I ended up graduating with just, I missed out on the first by that much. I got a high 2-1. In, in the midst of all this, in my second year, I went to, when I was working as a youth worker, I went to another solicitor's firm in East London um, and I told them about my story because I had to drop off some documents for one of the young people I was working with. They took me out to dinner and then they offered me a training contract in the second year of undergrad. I started with them 2018 before I'd even finished my final law degree exams. Finished my training contract with them at the end of 2019. Went freelance as a um, freelance um, police rep. Then I got admitted to the role. And this was in the middle of COVID last year. Now, because there was not, not much listeners about in courts, I cleaned up with all the mags court work. I, did, I clocked up 100 court cases by September. And then I thought, I'm going to take a punt. And I just got my higher rights of audience and I applied to transfer to the bar. Two of my best instructing solicitors wrote to, um, gave me references. And my chamber's great, James Street, who I'll say is probably the most diverse chambers out there if you look on our website. They, um, I gate crashed the party, <laughs> their 15th year anniversary party, got talking to the clerks as you do. They also invited me up to um, a lunch, a working lunch, and then I managed to get a, a, an offer of tenancy. There's something about me and food, you'll see. <laughs> so that's the key. If you want to get a pupillage, get, get introduced to a dinner or a lunch, but it works. But anyway, so... They um, offered me a full tenancy, said, look, you've had more experience than any second six people in the current climate, bearing in mind last year, a lot of pupils weren't able to go to the court. So BSB seemed to agree with them. And I um, got um, a total exemption from all forms of um, vocational and pupillage, uh, pupillage by the BSB. And I was called to the bar on um, the 30th of November last year. And so far, things have flown so much that I did my first jury trial um, last month. I actually got instructed on Monday, like them just gone, which was my birthday. I got instructed for an attempted murder. And things are like, it's, it's, it's actually gone beyond belief now. Bearing in mind, I five years ago or six years ago, I did not want to be a lawyer. I've never watched a legal show. I didn't know the difference between a barrister, a solicitor and a lawyer. Yeah, I was a client quite a few times in my past life, but I've had no interest in it and this career has just found me. So it's it's been a totally blessed journey, but um, I absolutely love it. It's the, it really is the best job in the world. And um, I'd say it's better than DJing. And that's DJing was great. So that's me. That's absolutely amazing. Thank you, Mark, for that. Wow. Um, so we have a few questions for you to answer now as well. Um, so in your opinion, what step need to be taken in the profession to tackle underrepresentation of BAME barristers? All right. So in terms of this particular one, I, I have some views on it and they're somewhat controversial. I feel that the bar are missing a trick. And the reason I say that is, look, there's plenty of, there's a there's a perpetuated myth by the media that lots of black people and Asian people are, are not necessarily from middle class. I've met an awful lot of middle class um, black and Asian barristers who their family's already at the bar, their parents are professionals, their parents are wealthy business owners, and they've been able to put their kids through private school and Knoxbridge and, and, and you know Oxford and Cambridge. Now, for me, the, what the bar always does is tick this box. Like even if um, a black or Asian person has come from wealth and had the same privileges as a middle-class white barrister, it's still ticking a diversity box. I say no. Where the bar is going wrong is that the bar needs to focus on class. And, and to do that, you need, you need to really look at the state schools and the non-Russell group universities. Now, you know, I know, and no, no disrespect to anyone who's listening or part of this today but there's an awful lot of people that have gone to Cambridge and Oxford that I know who, who are black and they've got a pupillage before they've even finished the bar course Oxford and Cambridge is still prejudice is still rife at the bar and and anyone who says that um, that's not the case is being disingenuous the, and the fact is is that they will get bumped up to the top of the queue and I've seen it I've uh, you know I've seen it even signs of that at my own chambers and for me I think one way to tackle this is to make um, applications blind in as far as to say that you don't put your university we want to know your grades your education but the Oxford the Cambridge thing needs to be cut out because those people are still finishing the top of the pile and we need to focus on working class people working class kids we can't just go, the, the racial aspect of it 
will, will, will still allow through people with privilege. Like, and as I said, just look at the the, gov the current government, the actual cabinet. Yeah, the 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 most um, ethnic balanced cabinet ever in history. But most of them come from wealth, and so the problem is you're still ticking that box. And if you do um, something which captures class, you will capture the people it's meant to capture. Because just like Brad said, look, I'm working class. And I'm, I'm still, my friends are still working class. Not much has changed apart from the job I do. But a lot of those people would still think the bar's not for them. And until we really show and prove that you can go to a, a you know, a, a crap state school like I went to, but you can still become a barrister, nothing's going to change. And we need, we need to openly, actively be more inclusive to people from that walk of life and go beyond just what we see as racial diversity. The bar has a class issue first and foremost because it predominantly um, has people from a middle class and an upper middle class background first and foremost then we can look at the other things so that's my answer to that question so in your opinion what has to be done to encourage diversity at the bar for people coming from backgrounds that that may be you know poorer rather than the privileged well as i said it, it, it's, it's got to be the class that you know like silas said that they're going into the right schools and and and, and all those things but I think we need to show these people that they're actually capable of getting pupillages. Look, I've seen so much diversity initiatives here and there's a lot of people that are doing them for the right reasons. There are some chambers that frankly are just doing them to raise their own profiles and I'm disgusted by it. The problem is, is that you've got 3,000 people a year applying for like 200 pupillages on the pupillage gate, pupil gateway, plus another 100 or so pupillages. Things need to radically change. We need to stop this and get a grip of this because nothing's going to change. I mean, an another suggestion that I had is... As a member of chambers, we um, vote to see who we would like to come to that chambers. And the thing is, it's a business decision. So I understand why people will say, let's go for the Oxford or the Cambridge option. However, that's because the burden is on us as barristers to make a financial investment in that pupil for that particular time. Now, I would say that I think that the burden should be shifted away from individual barristers and the inns of court need to be paying for ch chambers. I think that what the, the new policy, and I'm, I'm sure clerks are kind of leaning in that direction, but what I, I, I need to, I'd like to see is that there should be maybe two pupillages a year or if they can do more and at least one of those pupillages should be someone who attended state school and the inns of court need to fund it all and so everyone is entitled to scholarships from the inns but if you come from a working class background and it's means tested you get your pupillage funded in full from the inns of court and I hear you say oh where's this money going to come from so we as barristers we pay to the, the into the through and the bar mutual fund every year if and there's meant to be like 15 thousand practicing barristers if every one of us paid 10 pound towards it that would be 1.5 million a year that we could pay towards um, pupillages and guaranteed diversity and again if you go down the class route you wouldn't be discriminating uh, discriminating against any particular group because if you go for class you will capture the the, the black and, and asian and minority ethnic within that group and i would say what people have to understand the majority of the british public are working class so naturally the, high, the majority of, um, you know, I don't like this B-A-M-E term, it's pejorative. However, if you go down that route, you're going to capture the black and Asian and ethnic minority people within that class group. So we need to start thinking outside the box. And again, the inns of court need to do a lot more and start needing to fund the people. And I will just add that people that I know, friends who are barristers that qualified in the early 2000s and the 90s, are definitely someone of, of Silesh's um, generation when they qualified. Pupillages were unfunded back then, and it was a lot easier to get pupillage because chambers would offer more pupillages out because barristers didn't have to put their hands in their pockets. All this pupillage thing is about is money. It's a business decision. It's nothing more. People shouldn't take it personal, and I know a lot of knockback pupillage rejections are hard, but it's about business. But if the in of court invest they're the ones that can fix this situation and they can set the guidance going forward so just in closing it's um 
university blind and I say the Inns of Court should be funding all the pupillages and not left the chambers to do. Okay. Thanks, Mark. That's brilliant. Thank you. So now we move on and we're going to be hearing from Thomas McGarvey from Church Court Chambers. So if you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself and your journey to the bar, Thomas. Hi, Clara. I was sitting there thinking uh, which sucker is going to have to follow um, that wonderful talk from Mark. And, and I'm that sucker. Um, I'm, I also want to know when Mark's releasing his book because I'll have it um, ordered well in advance. And that's a remarkable story. And he's a, he's a real credit to the, to the profession. And I'm glad to see him at the bar. Um, I, I'm from Northern Ireland. Um, I'm an Irish Catholic. And um, uh, remarkably, I didn't stay in Northern Ireland to become a barrister because in Northern Ireland, um, you don't really have much chance of succeeding at the bar unless you have somebody in your family who is going to send you work as a solicitor. Um, it, it's a small pool of people acting in the legal profession there, and, and it's uh, not very diverse. And so I came over to England um, as somebody who was perhaps the first lawyer in my family. Um, my father was a teacher by training. My mother left school at 16, and they ended up, um, in, in ironically, working in the pub trade and so often people thought that the bar that I would end up at would be a very different bar and um, I, I tried to change things and, and came to the legal bar. Now I did have difficulties along the way and perhaps not difficulties um, like those that we've heard already but difficulties nonetheless and uh, one of the things that I faced um, as an Irish Catholic barrister was um, barristers of a particular type thinking it was funny to make Irish jokes in my company and thinking that paddy jokes were something that, that I perhaps would find particularly funny and that can be quite an awkward thing um, to have to listen to when, when you're trying to perhaps impress people um, along the way. And then you sit there awkwardly laughing at something that is actually quite insulting if you think about it. But my, um, my route to the bar was pretty traditional insofar as I did a law degree. Um, I then um, went along to bar school or BBC as it was at the time. Um, uh, perhaps at that stage, I realized the challenges that lay ahead because so many people at bar school um, already had pupillage, had family uh, again who were already at the bar. Um, had financial support such that they could go off to America and do wonderful things um, defending people on death row. Uh, all of these wonderful things that required funding, um, required finances and, and perhaps wasn't suitable for me. Now I did have assistance from my parents. I, I had, I had uh, lots of assistance, but I didn't have that level of assistance. And so um, things perhaps at that point became worrying for me and, and got more worrying as I started making my applications because um, I, I did very poorly in my first year and I don't think I had any interviews in my first year and um, alarm bells were ringing. Uh, am I the right person? Do I come from the right background? Um, yeah, have I made a massive mistake in, in investing money into this career? Uh, and ultimately I won't get a pupillage. And second year came along and again, um, alarm bells ringing, no pupillages, no interviews. And so I, I just took up everything that was on offer when it came to the inn, when it came to um, groups that were perhaps trying to promote diversity, trying to help people with their applications. I, I took every offer that was on, on offer and Finally, by my third year, um, I was lucky enough to, to be offered a pupillage in, in the chambers that I'm in at the moment. And ironically, the, the thing about the bar is it's so small. Um, I look at the, the people that are on this call and I know Salish and myself and Salish have done a trial together. And in fact, Mark's head of chambers um, was instrumental in helping me get pupillage. Um, Alan Jones, uh, Queen's Council. Um, ironically, I, I got a job as his legal assistant for a year uh, through somebody I met at the inn. So, Along the way, it's really important that even if you have nobody in your family who was a lawyer like I did, um, make sure that you make friends with everybody that you meet along the way and don't make any enemies because uh, it's a small world. And if you make enemies, it might not seem important at the time, but in 10 years or 15 years time when you're making an application to be something or to join another chambers or whatever it may be, um, along pops that person that you perhaps didn't get on with one day at the inn at a dining session or whatever it may be. So. Keep, keep close to everybody you meet along the way and don't be afraid to ask people because that's what I did. And thankfully after three years uh, and not giving up, um, I, I was lucky enough to get pupillage. And, and it is, you know, don't, don't be fooled. Um, it, there is an element of luck in all of this. I, I've seen some really, really good candidates from various backgrounds give up on the bar uh, and they shouldn't have given up because they would have been very successful. But perseverance and luck are two of the most important parts of all of this. You know, you've got to persevere and in the end, you've got to be lucky. Thank you, Thomas. Someone mentioned their wise words and completely agree. Um, so what would you say to the aspiring barrister students who may doubt themselves in their ability to become a BAME barrister? The first thing is um, don't ever categorise yourself as anything other than a future barrister. Um, your, your gender, your ethnicity, 
any other characteristic of a barrister really shouldn't be uh, relevant. It's really just down to integrity, judgment, perseverance, things of, of that nature. Um, it, it's clear traditionally the bar has a disproportionate number of um, white male barristers, particularly from a privately educated background. Uh, and that's not a familiar background to me. Uh, and it sounds like it's not a familiar background to, to, to many of the people talking tonight. Um, and so don't categorize yourself in, in any other way other than a barrister. You're going to be a barrister. You're going to be a good barrister. And if you persevere, that's exactly what you will be. Now, things have changed a lot um, over the years and they continue to change. And I think Brad's experience and Mark's experience is probably different to mine. Mine was different to Salish's. Um, when I interviewed for people at my chambers back in 2010, um, I, I was very, very happy to see a panel of three, which included uh, a white man from a working class background uh, with no private education, a black man from a working class background, an ex-police officer, in <laughs> fact, uh, again, no private education, uh, and a white woman from a middle class background. And it was a nice mix of people that immediately put me at ease. And so when I hear people talking about the importance of, of a panel interviewing being diverse, I, I fully agree with that because it was the first time I ever felt at ease in an interview, having been through quite a few interviews and some of which were solely white men. And, and that doesn't put anybody at ease. Even, even a white man doesn't feel at ease in, in that environment. You'd want to see diversity in front of you. So certainly um, th that was something that was really good to see. Um, find somebody who you can, you can aspire to be, I think, because um, I've heard mention of Dame Linda Dobbs um, this evening, and, and I know Dame Linda uh, fairly well because I'm counsel to her current banking review. It's a review that she's conducting uh, into um, banking issues with Lloyd's Banking Group. She, she was the first non-white high court judge in the UK. She, she was born in Sierra Leone. Um, she, uh, as a result of that, uh, has got a panel of about 40 or 50 barristers, which is perhaps the most diverse tapestry of barristers you will find at the bar, be it gender, be it ethnicity, be it age, it's a fantastic group of people to be involved with and it's inspiring because actually when I look at all of the work that's been done uh, with regard to diversity at the moment and um, a lot of the people that are involved in the review people that that have been picked by Dame Linda uh, because of a variety of reasons including their talent mainly and um, that they're from such a wide background and, and they are some of the voices that, that everybody will see both on social media speaking at different events these are the people that are that are succeeding at the bar and they're doing well so there are people out there find somebody who perhaps uh, you can aspire to somebody who comes from a different background if they're not exactly like you try and look for somebody who might be a little like you and, and then start knocking on their door you know say say to them find them at, at a networking event when, when times were normal you'd meet them at an event times aren't normal now but but i can see a, a chat bar on the side of the screen you know you see our names find us on linkedin you know we'll, we'll put our emails address email addresses there we'll try and respond to everybody and um, you won't get responses from everybody because people are busy but but that's where perseverance comes in persevere keep hassling don't be afraid to hassle people and don't be afraid of rejection if, if someone says i'm afraid i'm sorry i'm too busy um, i might say that three times out of five but twice i'll say yes no problem and then, then i'll be a mentor to people and, and give as much of my time as i possibly can so don't be afraid to persevere in that sense and look out for those people because ultimately they're the people that will help you along the way and then in turn when you're a barrister you'll be helping people along the way as well it's it's that kind of situation if you get a hand in all of this and you get some help you're likely to be somebody that will then give a hand and give help in due course so really the bottom line is hassle everybody around you try to find people that, that perhaps can help you don't be afraid to ask don't be afraid to get knocked back just keep asking because somebody will say yes and once one person says yes that could be the, that could be the difference in your applications Lovely, thank you, Thomas. And in relation to blind applications, do you think that blind applications will benefit BAME applicants? And will that in turn help diversify the bar? I think blind applications would benefit everybody um, and it would benefit the bar, it would benefit society, it, it would benefit everybody. Um, I think we, we've mentioned blind by respect of education, and, and that's very important. But I think uh, personally, if, if I were sitting down to set out how to do things, I'd be saying blind to gender, blind to ethnicity, blind to education. They're the three things um, that can perhaps at times because of unconscious bias and um, they can affect people. Uh, often it's not a deliberate action on anybody's behalf, um, but, but it may be unconscious. And so if you remove those three elements, it, it, would create, it creates a level playing field. Um, will that benefit? people from a, a black or ethnic minority background, um, you would think it probably would because they're disproportionately represented at the bar and that's got nothing to do with ability. Um, it, it may be to do with other things. So I would think it would benefit people uh, from a particular background, but ultimately it would benefit the entire profession because 
and you shouldn't be a barrister for any other reason than you are good at what you do that you 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 you, you satisfy the conditions of being a barrister that you've got the integrity that you've got the passion and that you've got the ability and that's got nothing to do with skin color that's got nothing to do with where you went to school and um, it, it's got everything to do with you wanting to be a barrister and you having those skills and so if you remove those three elements from every application and um, then that perhaps makes it a, a much more level playing field and, and perhaps the time for that to happen is now because once upon a time a lot of applications were made by individual applications in writing to, to particular chambers it might horrify people to know that, that the chambers that actually gave me pupillage um, told me during my first interview, one of the reasons I was given an interview was because I'd taken the time to handwrite my application. My cover letter was handwritten. And they asked me, why did I do that? And I said, well, because so many of my colleagues are copying and pasting uh, and you can't copy and paste in handwriting. And I can tell you that because this is about the 40th draft of the cover letter that I sent to your chambers because I kept making stupid mistakes. And so um, I think one of the things that you can do is remove those elements. And, and because of the portal system now, applications are no longer handwritten or no longer typed out. Um, you do it through an application process, it would be very easy for the Bar Council to say, right, there's Thomas McGarvey, he's applying, he's now candidate number one, uh, and that's it. Candidate number one, uh, and your grades are there, and all of the wonderful things you may have done are there, but your sex is not there, your gender is not there, your ethnicity is not there, uh, and perhaps uh, as importantly, or most importantly, uh, your educational background is not there, because it's a nonsense to say that somebody that went to Oxford or Cambridge is going to be a better barrister than somebody that went to a, a lesser well-known university. And partly because the system of education in the UK, sadly, it, it perhaps prefers those who come from publicly schooled uh, backgrounds, private, private education backgrounds. And if you've went to a particular school and you've got particular grades because you've been at that school, it, it perhaps gives you a benefit when you apply to certain institutions. That's just the way it is, unfortunately. And so uh, we as a profession need to perhaps try to counteract that. And I agree with everything that Mark has said in that respect. I think we can, we can do much more. Um, and the Bar Council, perhaps through the portal, is the, is the obvious place to start. And, and, and a, a fair playing field at that stage um, would be much more obvious to everybody applying because you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't be blinded by gender, you wouldn't be blinded by ethnicity, you wouldn't even be looking at it. You wouldn't know which school somebody went to because it was no longer an issue and you wouldn't, you wouldn't unconsciously be taking it to, in, into account because I'd like to think I would never take any of those things into account. Uh, is it possible that I would? It's always possible. Is it impossible if you remove them from the application? Absolutely. So remove them, remove the, the, the possibility of unconscious bias. Thank you for that, Thomas. I know that Silas has raised his hand there. He wants to come in on that. It's just a point that, that, that Thomas was making about blind applications and blind interviews. This is nothing new. There is research all over the world that's been done in not just our profession, but across a number of professions. One of the most famous uh, bit of research was in America, when in the 70s, someone noticed, would you believe, that uh, there aren't enough female orchestra players on stage. Uh, and the, the response of most conductors were, was, well, women aren't very good at playing instruments, are they? Uh, as soon as they started doing blind interviews so that the, the performer for the audition would be behind a screen, they discovered that the number of women getting the job in the orchestra suddenly shot up. There, there are experiments of that sort that are validated all across, and so uh, we should be looking at all of these things. Thank you, Silas. Thank you for that. So that brings me to our final guest of the evening, and that is Russell Hobbs. Russell Hobbs is from Clark's Room. Thanks for being here this evening, Russell. And if you'd like to tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do and a little more about Clark's Room. Yeah, thanks a lot, Clara. And it's a pleasure to join you tonight. And great, honestly, you guys, uh, inspirational. I can tell you that because when I joined the bar, well, joined Chambers in 1992, uh, the mix of uh, the members of Chambers were uh, no, nowhere like the, the mix we've got on uh, the presentation tonight. So really inspirational, guys. So really great to hear your journeys to the bar. Uh, yeah, a bit about me. Uh, I'm obviously not a barrister. I'm a clerk. I started, like I say, back in 1992 in Nottingham. Uh, but I only joined Clark's Room uh, last November. So Clark's Room is a very different entity to what I've been used to. I've always clerked in traditional sets. And Clark's Room is, as uh, a lot of you, may already know is is a unique uh, nationwide business which is underpinned by award-winning technology uh, a lot of the technology runs how this uh, business works we have 180 barristers now that work uh, from home and receive all the clerking and regulatory requirements from clerk's room 
Uh, I think last year, a lot of tra chambers, traditional chambers tried to reinvent themselves because of the pandemic. And because we were already well placed in terms of the technology, I think that's lent uh, us to be able to deal with a lot of the way things are now working in the current climate. Our technology allows us to work 24 seven and 365 days a year. So uh, the culture though is the main thing at Clark's Room. Uh, we're committed to welcoming people from different backgrounds and ethnicities. Uh, we're currently undertaking a racial equality audit with members to uh, identity the, identify the barriers to race equality so we can work at tackling those. So I've been really, really surprised at the way all the members, although they are working remotely, uh, support one another in the process. And I mean, for instance, today we had a, a Teams with the pupils. We've got 12 pupils at the moment. We're really trying to, the MD at Clark's Room, Stephen Ward, does so much for trying to encourage uh, pupillage applications. And over the last, I think, 18 months or 12 months, we've supported 18 individuals who were stuck in the system because of the pandemic with either uh, delayed exams uh, or their results or offers, partial pupillages, international visas. We've, we've stepped forward and tried to help as many people as we can because obviously we see that, you know, the future of the bar relies upon bringing these people through. Uh, so that, I think I'll go on to one of the other questions. We'll probably tackle the pupillage academy, which we're trying to set up with the bar standards board, but it's just a very different setup to, to what I've been used to, but it's very refreshing and it allows uh, a lot of people to have a different work-life balance to what they'd normally have in a traditional set of chambers. Thanks, Russell. So what are Clark's Room doing to ensure equality and diversity at the bar? Okay, yeah, with uh, Clark's Room, we're quite committed to encouraging that uh, an environment where equality, diversity and inclusion can flourish. As part of our overall strategy, uh, we designed our fee structure so that everybody is treated fairly. Uh, we don't, uh, like in the traditional way, uh, charge a chamber's rent or fixed rent. We just charge a percentage. Uh, we have a simple standard uh, service level agreement, sorry, uh, which an agreement with the barrister individually and provides for services personally, uh, which allows the barrister to just get on and do the barrister job. Uh, the virtual environment offers the members to set their own work preferences, uh, agree their own fees in terms of set their own fees. Uh, and availability, therefore allowing flexibility, quality of income, and a positive work-life balance. All our software, like I say, is award-winning IT, and therefore it allows us to report on the distribution of work. Uh, it monitors the data, the technology ensures a fair allocation of work using algorithms to allocate un un unassigned cases. Uh, and we can compare allocation data and information to identify the reasons for any disparity in the allocation of unassigned work. Uh, all our policies are regularly updated and reviewed in line with the BSB. Obviously, all the policies include things like anti-racist training, flexible working, parental leave, return to work, uh, flexible learning and adjustments, reasonable adjustments policies. And we've also done a lot of unconscious bias training amongst both my, myself and the members who interview at uh, the pupillage stage. Uh, and then obviously on to recruitment. Uh, that tends to be where we try and actively uh, promote equality and diversity and inclusion. Thanks, Russell. And just touching on, you know, we heard what, what Thomas was saying there about blind applications. And obviously, you know, Clark's Room are, are intending to um, put together the Pupillage Academy. How do you think uh, blind applications will benefit BAME applicants in particular? And you know, do you think that it will diversify the bar doing this, being able to do that? Yeah, I think we found that, well, it's, it's known that access to pupillage is one of the biggest barriers to increasing diversity at the bar, and in particular to BAME candidates. Uh, for that reason, I think blind, blind applications are vitally important. A recent survey concluded that people of colour uh, were 50% less likely uh, to be uh, selected for pupillage than their white counterpart. Uh, the breakdown of BAME pupils, I think in 2019, uh, was 19%. But I think since the onset of COVID, I think worryingly that uh, a number of pupillages will be reduced, uh, especially in the criminal and the uh, family bar. So I think that might, and that, that's where you tend to find a lot more BAME applicants apply. Uh, so I think there's a tendency that that might drop, unfortunately. I think lots more is being done though, encouragingly on the Northeastern circuit, for instance, I know that 100 barristers uh, came together and created a diversity outreach program uh, to encourage minorities to come to the bar. And there are many more initiatives and mentoring programs out there. 
Uh, but like I say, our key, uh, our key uh, option now is hopefully to get approval from the BSB for our pupillage academy. Uh, it's obviously, I can't go into too much detail yet, but there is actually a website uh, you can go on. It's called pupillageacademy.com and you can download and have a look at our brochure, which we're proposing. Uh, the Pupillage Academy aims to encourage the provision of more flexible uh, routes to qualification, promote increased accessibility to training, as well as addressing the affordable, affordability of bar training. The first stage will be completely blind. It will be a questionnaire and we'll go actually further than the requirements of the Equality Act 2010. We won't ask for any personal data or details that would identify any of the nine protected characteristics of the Act, provide any information on current personal circumstances or personal history, or provide any information on uh, educational background. Second stage is an online application. Uh, and when we shortlist, we'll explore ex uh, adjustments and obviously we'll entertain a, a contextual approach. Uh, because we uh, obviously feel that there's a lot of need to boost social mobility and ensure that we do not overlook uh, promising talent. Uh, we believe that the Pupillage Academy, we hope will be able to will provide the maximum amount of pupillages uh, because we won't be awarding uh, enhanced awards and we'll also be placing value on pupils who've gained experience outside their training environment. Uh, we see those individuals as better able to adapt to the role of a, a self-employed barrister and reflect of the people in our society and the public they serve. So we're hopeful, I mean, with the Pupillage Academy, we're hopeful that we can invite stakeholders to, because I think I agree entirely with Mark, what Mark said earlier about the, the money and the cost it costs for chambers to provide pupillages. Is. We need more people to invest in that and get funding from say the inns. I think that's crucial. Thanks, Russell. And I'd like to open up the floor to all our guest speakers this evening um, to see their uh, views on blind applications. Blind applications, you say? Yeah. Um, I think I, I can't really add to um, everything that's been said already. We had a little chat about it in the chat box as well, but um, it, it, it sort of goes without saying that there is obvious value in eliminating anything that that uh, indicates that the person has a protected characteristic which cr may create the risk of, of bias when we're looking at these, when people, um, members of chambers are looking at those applications. But, you know, the, I think it can be taken a step further than just get rid of university, get rid of, um, you know, sex get rid of you know, uh, etc there are because there are other factors um within applications sometimes that are tells whether you know it or not about uh, where that person comes from and i'll use that in a very loose way um so you know n name i know we spoke about eliminating name but name is a key one in that if the person's family name isn't is difficult to pronounce that could create a lot of um uh that can discourage some people from uh inviting that person to interview but even more deeper than that when you're asking about you know for example someone's accolades from school what what are your achievements and whatever uh, that you had at school now at my school um sounds much like mark's we there was not much going on you uh there was no sort of uh prefects or or um, anything of the sort that you could kind of step up and show yourself to be sort of beyond the crowd it was very uh, there were very few sports teams or anything like that so it you know generally everybody did the same stuff uh, it was very hard to kind of engage there was no funding for school trips or anything like that so you know, and there are, and you can think how that list would grow on. But when chambers are looking at, at things like that, and it's a very broad, broad um, discussion now, but when chambers are looking at things like that, you need to peel back the layers and think, where does this take me? What kind of applicant is going to be able to show this that I'm asking for? Um, and there are a lot of questions that tend towards applicants from privileged backgrounds. Thanks, Brad. Silas, you have your hand um, About 20 years ago, um, some of us were very concerned about 
the underrepresentation of black and Asian uh, people in, in some of the big city firms. So we invited uh, the recruitment partners and surprisingly about 50 of the recruitment partners of the big city firms uh, turned up and their constant mantra when we gave them anecdotal evidence uh, of underrepresentation was we only select the best which really the subtext was uh, how dare you uh, tell us to recruit more and lower our standards we only recruit the best about a, two years later the law society then did its own research using a university that research compared like with like. So it compared, for example, a, a candidate like me from Manchester University with a 2-2 degree, with a, a candidate who was white with a 2-2 degree from Manchester. And so you were for the first time able to compare like for like. That showed that if you are black, compared to your black counterpart, who was, uh, uh, to your white counterpart, who was equally qualified, who had one seventh one seventh the chance of a training contract in one of the big city firms. If you're uh, Asian, you had something like one half the chance. We invited these recruitment partners again after that research and to their credit, many of them turned up, not all of them. Not a single one of them now repeated the mantra, we only select the best. And so there is a huge amount of unintended or unseen bias. Uh, and part of uh, the answer is for people to recognize that even though they may think they're not biased, uh, that there is a real possibility that they are until they learn how to find it out in themselves in their own organizations. And of course, therefore, uh, the blind applications is part of that process. Clara, just on, on that point, um, I, I've obviously been involved in people who interviews over the years. Um, it's something that my chambers thrust you straight into as soon as you're a pupil. Once you're a junior tenant, you're, you're expected to be involved because for many reasons, it gives you um, a bit more information as a chambers about what the process is like from the other side. And certainly when I sit on pupillage or when I've sat on pupillage interviews, I, I kind of switch off a lot of the time when people are going through the usual um, explanation of, you know, which school do they go to, what grades do they get, because they were things that perhaps weren't the strengths of my application. And so I tend to kind of think, well, you know, where, where's the meat in this application? Where, where, where am I going to work out whether this person is a good barrister or not? Because anybody can go to a particular school, anybody can do a particular bit of work experience and tick a lot of boxes. But ultimately, once you've got past all the tick boxes or, or lack of tick boxes, where's the, where's the strength in this person's future as a barrister? And I think sometimes when there's advocacy assessments where somebody gets to do something like a bail application or perhaps has to answer a question like, um, what area of law would you change and why? And um, that's a question that has nothing to do with what school you went to, has nothing to do with your background, but it gives you a chance to, to show to the, to the three or four people in front of you, uh, what are your skills? And it doesn't really matter what law you're changing and why, but it, it's about how do you present it and how do you come across as somebody with your one chance to, to, to speak to people directly uh, on, on a level playing field where your, your degree doesn't matter, uh, your school doesn't matter, none of these things matter, but here's your chance, persuade them. So I think um, more use could be put to the, those sorts of elements of um, interviews whereby it's not so much um, box ticking for other reasons, but it gives people a chance to do something that, that isn't based on their past, it's, it's in the moment. And so we often give a question to people five, 10 minutes before an interview and we say, um, you know, could you answer this question during the interview? And they haven't had time to prepare it. And so everybody's on a level playing field. They, they've got to answer that question and, and they've, they've all got the same amount of time to answer that question. And I think that makes a big difference when you, when you incorporate things like that, that perhaps level the playing field a little bit. I think that could be used by much more chambers. Thanks, Thomas. I can see Mark has his hand raised there. If you want to come in. Yeah, I'll just add uh, uh, one other important factor as well. And I think people from Mr. Trick is networking is essential to get to know people that can possibly give you that particular opportunity. Uh, and not how Thomas said that he met my, my head of chambers, at, at, um, Alan Jones QC. And the thing is we've all, throughout our careers, we've all met that certain someone who can have influence over our careers. And so I would encourage any of the students out there that's listening, soon especially when things like the social distancing reduces and you can go to actual physical events or even down to there's places like i'm not encouraging people to drink but it worked for me is <laughs> down to chancery lane and around red lion street and i know you know where that is so just around around that neck of the woods and oh there's the pegasus bar i'm a member of inner temple I, i've not heard much people talk about in the temple tonight but i'm repping for them but um again we've got the, the bars and there's always a lot of us 
Chinese barristers hang out after a day is caught or we'll meet up there. Look, we're a friendly bunch, especially those of us at the criminal bar. And you can approach anyone. You know, I'm always happy to talk to people. I'm always happy to, if you see me out in the bar, happy to sit down over a drink, give career advice or what, whatever I can do. And, you know, some of the my closest friends at the bar now are people that I've met in, in that capacity of events when we've become friends, we've gone out for drinks. And these are people, look, I come from a particular background, working class, you know, some of my closest friends are um, middle class, upper middle class white males. Um, and I would never even have, have, have thought of talking to these kind of guys, but it's, but you find that when you just talk to people, you've got more in common with them than you think. And, and again, everyone is really approachable, even for, example when you do get into the profession even talking to people in the robing rooms I've struck struck up some great conversations and you know come on guys we miss that uh, you know the physical contact in the robing room the banter and all that so sort of, get to meet us get to know us do your networking get numbers get cards because you never know when we'll be able to assist you and all it takes is for you to go out on that right mini pupillage with us make the right impression help us out in a particular way you will be remembered and that will that could go a long way to securing your pupillage down the road thanks mark and just another quick question because of course we have members that may want to become barristers and we talk about networking and putting yourself out there but there may be some people that may not necessarily feel comfortable with that or maybe family don't allow for them to go out to these sorts of events and um, so any advice for those um candidates there i nominate one of the others to talk about. So I've spoken too much already. I think so Brad wants to yeah. say something there. I'll say something quickly. It's, it's one of these things where, um, especially when as things get back to normal, like just by coming today, I'll say, say for a start, by coming to stuff like today um, is helpful no end because if you come across any of us in court one day on a, on a mini or in pupillage or something like that, I'm sure I speak for everybody when I say we'll be happy to chat to you about about anything so and this is this is networking in one fashion but in the sort of old-fashioned sense as it is now the pre-2020 networking where you go to a, a drinks function or a meal or something like that and meet a bunch of people it is it's difficult um and you but if you can go um try your absolute best to push yourself out there and get stuck in we everyone feels anxious i remember the first time i ever went to a um networking function back in for the bar back in Nottingham and I think I spoke to two or three people and I uh, and I got my first ever mini pupillage out of that at, at Chambers in Nottingham um, and it is you know because you just you double guess what you're saying every time um, uh, whenever you speak and you think that you're going to come across as silly or, um, or or say something dumb but everyone feels like that to some degree whether they show it or not, and you get better at it. The more that you go to this stuff, the better you get at just speaking to new people and hearing their stories. And you know, and and um, one of the tricks that I use is spend less time talking about myself and ask more about them. Just you know, because it's, it's way more interesting to hear about other people for a start than just reading off your own stuff. Um, and, and if you can't go, then it, to things like that, then the to, to answer the second part of the question then think of inventive things that you can do to introduce yourself to members of the profession otherwise like for example calls on on, on and hit somebody up on linkedin and just ask i've had several people even just this week say can could we have a zoom coffee and chat about your journey to the bar and stuff like that and you'll find somebody myself included that's more than happy to chat and that's your kind of that'll be your replacement for networking big net and it can be more valuable to be honest with you, because then you've got a directed one way conversation with someone, whereas a lot of the time I remember being a student, you'll have one barrister to a table of 10 people and it's like flies around, you know, you know, the rest. But Thanks, Brad. Thanks so much for that. Um, so, yeah, I, I've really enjoyed the evening and thank you so much to my guests, Brad Lewis from QEB, Hollis Whiteman, Mark Robinson from Great James Street Chambers. Thomas McGarvey from Church Court Chambers, Russell Hobbs from Clerk's Room, and Silesh Mehta from Redline Chambers. Thank you so much for being a part of this this evening. I do hope that everyone that has attended has had 
questions answered and are comfortable um, going forward with their, their aspirations to become barristers. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone, have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Take care, bye-bye.